For 25 years, from 1973 through 1997, an Italian priest named Father Stefano Gobi said that he received locutions from the Blessed Mother. In these messages, she spoke of our times and reiterated the requests she made at Fatima. Although her messages are for everyone, in these messages, she particularly asks priests for greater holiness and to be more active in promoting consecration to her Immaculate Heart. Father Gobi's spiritual director urged him to write down the messages that came to him. In due time, they were published with multiple imprimaturs as thousands of priests, bishops, and cardinals eagerly asked for translations in many languages. This recording is not professional and not for profit. Volunteer readers have undertaken to make these available as audio podcasts. You may purchase the book To the Priests, Our Lady's Beloved Sons at mmp usa.net. Presented here are the messages from 1989, beginning January 1st to December 31st. Message number 397. Come, Lord Jesus. Como, Italy, January 1st, 1989. Solemnity of Mary, Mother of God. I am your Immaculate Mother, who is leading you to Jesus and bringing you to peace. Today the whole church rejoices as it contemplates the ineffable mystery of my divine and universal motherhood. At the beginning of this new year, which will be marked by a succession of grave and significant events, you are looking in a special way to me as the Mother of Hope and Queen of Peace. In the time of the great tribulation through which you are living, my motherly presence will become continually stronger and more extraordinary. The greater and more universal the reign of my adversary, the red dragon, will become, the greater and more universal the victorious presence of the woman clothed with the sun will likewise become. For this reason... You have, as of now, entered into a period of time marked by a strong presence of mine in your midst, and this will become manifest to all by means of extraordinary events. I am your tender mother, who has the duty of leading you to Jesus, your Lord and your Savior. In these years, which still separate you from the end of this century, I will take action in all manner of ways in order that the reign of Jesus be restored among you and that the Lord Jesus may be loved and glorified by all. Come, Lord Jesus, in the life of each one, by means of divine grace, of love, and of sanctity. I will act in a very powerful way to bring all of you who have consecrated yourselves to my Immaculate Heart to a great sanctity, so that Jesus may live, work, and shine forth more and more in your life. Come, Lord Jesus, in families, to help them to rediscover the life of communion, of mutual and reciprocal love, of perfect unity, and of a complete availability to the gift of life. Come, Lord Jesus, in nations, which have need of becoming once again communities open to the spiritual and material needs of all, especially of the little, the needy, the sick, the poor, and the marginalized. There is in preparation for you the coming of the reign of Jesus, which will bring you into a new era of great brotherhood and of peace. For this reason, at the beginning of of a period of time, which is very important, because during it a plan prepared and completed by myself will be carried out. I am today urging you all to band together in the prayer which your Heavenly Mother, united with the Holy Spirit, her Divine Spouse, directs each day to the Father. Come, Lord Jesus. Only when Jesus will have brought his reign into your midst will all humanity at last be able to enjoy the great 
gift of peace. Message number 398. I am bringing you to Jesus. Milan, Italy, February 2nd, 1989. Feast of the Presentation of the Child Jesus. Beloved sons, live with joy the mystery of the presentation of the child Jesus in the temple of Jerusalem, and with docility let yourselves also be carried in my motherly arms. Forty days after his birth, in fulfillment of the prescriptions of the law, together with my most chaste spouse Joseph, I go up to the temple, both to offer to the Lord my firstborn son and to carry out the sacrifice prescribed for his ransom. With what love I clasp the child Jesus in my motherly arms, and with what docility and filial abandonment the little babe allows himself to be carried by me as I press him with boundless tenderness to my heart. And carried, presented, and offered by the mother, Jesus enters into the glory of his temple. Jesus enters into the temple of Jerusalem because for him, the Messiah, Lord, and Redeemer, it was built and sanctified. Jesus comes in the splendor of his glory and takes possession of his divine dwelling place. Jesus is manifested in the splendor of his light for revelation to all the Gentiles. Jesus is announced in advance as a sign of contradiction for the salvation and ruin of many in Israel. Jesus is received into the arms of old Simeon as the Messiah awaited for centuries and as Savior of his people. And within the mystery of his mission, there is intimately engrafted the unfolding of my motherly function. As for you, O mother... A sword shall pierce your soul. Because my duty as mother is that of bringing Jesus to you and of bringing you to Jesus, I am the way along which you must travel if you want to reach your Lord and Savior. I am bringing you to Jesus. I am bringing you to Jesus, your truth. This is why in these times when many are leaving the faith to follow errors, I am intervening with my numerous and extraordinary manifestations in order to lead you all to the full truth of the gospel. You must be only the lived-out gospel so that you too may be able to give the light of the truth. I am bringing you to Jesus, your life. This is why today, when many are falling into the darkness of sin and of death, I am helping you through my strong presence in your midst to live in the grace of God so that you also can share in the very life of the Lord Jesus. In these dark times of the great tribulation, if you do not allow yourselves to be carried in my arms with filial abandonment and with great docility, it is difficult for you to succeed in escaping the subtle snares which my adversary sets for you. His seductions have become so dangerous and subtle that hardly anyone, any longer, succeeds in escaping them. You are running the great danger of falling into the seduction which my adversary is setting for you in order to draw you away from Jesus and from me. All can fall into his trap. Priests and even bishops can fall into it. The faithful and even those consecrated can fall into it. The simple and even the learned can fall into it. The disciples and even the masters can fall into it. Those will never fall into it who, as little children, consecrate themselves to my immaculate heart and allow themselves to be carried in my motherly arms. As of now... It will become ever clearer and clearer to the church and to the world that the little flock, which in these years of the great apostasy, will remain faithful to Jesus and to his gospel, will be entirely protected in the motherly enclosure of my immaculate heart. 
He is his only begotten Son. He is the word consubstantial with him. He is the reflection of his beauty. He is the revelation of his love. Jesus and the Father are one single being. From the Father, through the Son, there is given to you as gift the Spirit of love, in order that you too may be able to penetrate into the stupendous mystery of this divine unity. If Jesus becomes your way, you come into the arms of his and your heavenly Father. If you walk with Jesus, you carry out the divine will in your life with that love and that docility with which Jesus has always done the will of the Father. And thus you live with the confidence and the abandonment of little children who expect and receive everything as a gift of love from their Father who is in heaven. And then I, your heavenly mother, am able to carry you each day upon the altar of my immaculate heart, to the temple of the glory and the light of the Lord. Thus, I am able to offer you in life to the perfect glorification of the Most Holy Trinity, and by means of you, I am able to spread everywhere the light of its divine splendor. When this light will have illumined and transformed the whole world, Jesus will come to you in glory to restore his kingdom. Message number 399, Jesus Comes, Como, Italy, March 23rd, 1989, Holy Thursday. Beloved sons, today is your Pasch. Live it in intimacy of life with Jesus, your brother, who has personally associated you in the exercise of his high and eternal priesthood. Live in love for him. How Jesus has loved you. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I have earnestly desired to eat this Pasch with you before I suffer. How Jesus loves you. Each day he renews again the gift of this, his last supper, of his sacrifice accomplished on Calvary. You are an important part of this, his plan of love. Today you find yourselves gathered about your bishops to renew the promises which you made at the moment of your priestly ordination. Renew them with joy and with confidence. Renew them with love as a sign of profound gratitude to him who has chosen you. Each day Jesus comes by means of you, his priests and sons of my maternal predilection. Jesus comes by means of your word, which repeats the words of his gospel of salvation in every language and to all men. Quote, Go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus comes by means of your priestly action, which is exercised in bringing all to him, your Redeemer and Savior. Quote, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Jesus comes by means of the Eucharistic sacrifice, which renews that accomplished by him on Calvary to wash again today with his divine blood all the sin and the evil of the world. Quote, Do this in memory of me. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. Jesus comes by means of the sacrament of reconciliation, which brings back all sinners to the house of his merciful love. Quote, Who sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. John chapter 20, verse 23. Jesus comes by means of the sacraments of which you are the ministers and of your person which must reflect the light of his perennial presence. Quote, I am with you all days until the end of the world. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. In this your day of Holy Thursday, I ask each one of you to give to all the joy of his divine presence in your midst. Then, in the immense darkness which still surrounds everything, you brighten up the earth with the light of Jesus Christ 
who comes again today by means of you. Message number 400. Remain with Jesus on the cross. Como, Italy, March 24, 1989. Good Friday. I am here with the Apostle John, who represents all of you, my beloved sons, beneath the cross on which my son Jesus is living out the bloody hours of his atrocious agony. Every moan of his agony pierces as a sword my sorrowful soul. Every drop of his suffering is gathered in the open chalice of my immaculate heart. I am here to seek a little love and compassion to offer in order to alleviate the great thirst of Jesus who is in agony. I am asking for a little love, but about us there is inhumane wickedness, deep hatred, shrieks, and blasphemies which go up from the hearts and the lips of those who are assisting at his execution. And among these, there is a cry which pierces my heart, wounds it, and causes it to bleed with indescribable pain. Come down from the cross, if you are the Son of God, save yourself. Come down from the cross, and then we will believe in you. But indeed, it was to mount this cross that my son was born, that he grew up, that he lived, to become the docile lamb who, meek, is led to the slaughter. He is the true lamb of God who takes away all the sins of the world. I, through my motherly presence, must today help him to remain on the cross, that the will of the Father be accomplished and that you might be redeemed and saved by him. Remain, O my son, on the cross. I am here to help you. Stretch yourself on your scaffold to suffer, to die. Remain, O my son, on the cross. Only thus do you save us. Only thus do you draw the whole world to yourself. For this you came down from the bosom of the Father into my virginal motherly womb. For this, for nine months, I carried you in my womb and gave you flesh and blood for your human birth. For this, you were born of me in Bethlehem, and you grew up, like every man, through the rhythm of your human development. For this, you opened up like a flower during your infancy, and you were formed in the vigor of your adolescence. For this you bore the weight of daily labor in the poor home of Nazareth. You were assisted each day by me, your tender mother, and the precious help of your legal father, Joseph. For this you have spent the three fatiguing years of your public life, announcing the gospel of salvation, healing the sick, pardoning sinners, opening the gates of the kingdom to the poor, the little, the humble, and the oppressed. For this you have undergone the judgment and the condemnation of the religious tribunal, ratified by Pilate, who has delivered you over to the cross. And today, behold, you are stretched upon the throne of your glory, prepared by the Heavenly Father for you, his only begotten Son, gentle and divine Lamb, who take away from the world, all sin, evil, hatred, impurity, and death. O precious and fruitful cross, who carry in your arms the Savior of the world. O sweet and saving wood, upon which is hung the price of our ransom. O cross, blessed and sanctified by the paschal victim, who today is immolating himself upon you, in the one and only sacrifice which redeems and saves all. Beloved sons, on this day of Good Friday, permit that I might repeat also to you, remain with Jesus on the cross. Do not give in to the subtle temptations of my adversary, to the facile seductions of the world, to the voices of those who again today repeat to you, come down from the cross. No, you also, like Jesus, 
must understand the divine plan of your personal priestly offering. You too must say yes to the will of the Father and be open to words of prayer and of pardon. Because today you also, like Jesus, must be immolated for the salvation of the world. Message number 401 in the New Sepulcher, Como, Italy, March 25, 1989, Solemnity of the Annunciation of the Lord, Holy Saturday. In the New Sepulcher, the body of my son Jesus rests in the sleep of death, upon my virginal bosom, where the word of the Father placed himself after the yes which I gave at the moment of the Annunciation, his spirit is placed, and I feel myself to be a sorrowful and contented mother, wounded and soothed, submersed in an ocean of sorrow and enwrapped in a mantle of peace, racked by tears and composed in an interior and divine blessedness. All now has been accomplished. Now I am keeping vigil in an act of incessant prayer, as my heart opens itself to the certainty of the resurrection of my son Jesus, my mind is illumined by the light of his prophecy, and my person is all straining forward in the expectation of this, his glorious moment. This is the day of my motherly solitude. This is the day of my immense sorrow. This is the fruitful day of my sure hope. This is the first day of my new and spiritual motherhood. Enter, beloved sons, into the cradle of my immaculate heart, and prepare yourselves as well for the moment of your new birth. In the new sepulcher, where the lifeless body of my son Jesus lies for this one day, place the man who in you must die. Place the man of sin and of vice, of hatred and of egoism, of avarice and of lust, of pride and of haughtiness, of discord and of disbelief. Let there die in you today all that you have inherited from the first man, and let there emerge at last into the light the new man, who was born in the new sepulcher, where Christ is risen in the glorious splendor of his divinity, the new man of grace and of holiness, the new man of love and of communion, the new man of mercy and of purity, the new man of humility and of charity, the new man of docility and of obedience, the new man formed in the new sepulcher and who comes to to life at the joyous moment of the resurrection of Christ. This new birth of yours comes to pass in the cradle of my immaculate heart, beside me, your tender mother, who thus initiates the new task of her spiritual and universal motherhood. Only this new man, who is born in the paschal mystery of Christ, can throw open wide the door of the sepulchre in which there lies today the whole of humanity, at this point dead, to cause it to arise to a new era of grace and of holiness, which the risen Christ brought you at the moment of his victory over sin and over death. Message number 402, in expectation of his glorious return. Como, Italy, March 26, 1989. Easter Sunday. Beloved sons, live in the joy of Easter. Jesus Christ, scourged, crowned with thorns, reviled, led to the cross, crucified and put to death as a malefactor, is risen. With the power which comes to him from his person and from his divine nature, he has summoned from death his human nature, and in the splendor of his glory, he comes forth victorious from the sepulchre. Christ risen is alive in your midst. Do not fear. He is guiding the events of human history to the realization of the will of the Heavenly Father and of his great plan of salvation. 
Christ risen is now seated in heaven upon his throne of glory at the right hand of the Father. To him all things are subjected. Beneath his footstool all his enemies will be humbled and defeated. As of today, human history is opened up to the full glorification of the risen Christ. The risen Christ will come again to you on the clouds of heaven in the full splendor of his glory. Live today in expectation of his glorious return. Do not allow yourselves to be discouraged by the momentary triumph of evil and of sin. Do not let the present victory in the world, the victory of the obstinate rejection of God, of rebellion against his law of love, and of a so universal impiety, sadden you. Nor should you allow yourselves to be seized by doubt or lack of confidence in seeing the church so wounded and stricken, ensnared and betrayed. Let the paschal joy be greater than every human reason for apprehension and sadness. Christ risen is alive in your midst. Christ risen marks with his victory the events of the world and of history. Christ risen wills to restore his kingdom in your midst, that he may be glorified by the whole created universe. Live always in joy and in a firm hope, in expectation of his glorious return. Message number 403, The Two Wings of the Great Eagle, Taramo, Italy, May 6, 1989. First Saturday. My beloved sons, today you are venerating me in a special way on the first Saturday of this month of May, which is specially dedicated to me by you. You are gathered in cynicals of brotherly sharing and of prayer with your heavenly mother. How much comfort you give to my deep sorrow, how much joy you bring to my immaculate heart. Because, by means of you who have responded to me, devotion to me is now flourishing again in all the church. Thus, I am able to exercise in these times of yours the great power which has been given to me by the Most Holy Trinity to render harmless the attack which my adversary, the Red Dragon, has unleashed against me vomiting from his mouth a river of water to submerge me. The river of water is made up of the collection of all the new theological doctrines which have sought to obscure the image of your heavenly mother, to deny her privileges, to restructure devotion to her, and to cast ridicule upon all those who are devoted to her. Because of these attacks of the dragon in these years, piety toward me has steadily diminished among many of the faithful and in some places has even disappeared. But to the help of your heavenly mother, there have come the two wings of the great eagle. The great eagle is the word of God above all the word contained in the gospel of my son Jesus. Of the four Gospels, the eagle indicates that of St. John, because he flies higher than all, enters into the very heart of the Most Holy Trinity, affirming with forcefulness the divinity, the eternity, and the consubstantiality of the Word, and the divinity of Jesus Christ. The two wings of the eagle are the word of God received, loved, and kept with faith, and the word of God lived with grace and charity. The two wings of faith and of charity, that is to say, of the word of God received and lived by me, permitted me to fly above the river of water of all the attacks made upon me, because they have manifested to the world my true greatness." And then I sought a refuge for myself in the desert. The desert in which I have made my habitual dwelling place is made up of the hearts and the souls of all those children who receive me, 
who listen to me, who entrust themselves completely to me, who consecrate themselves to my immaculate heart. In the desert in which I find myself, I am working today my greatest prodigies. I am working them in the heart and in the soul, that is to say, in the life of all my littlest children. Thus I am leading them to follow me along the road of faith and of charity, bringing them to receive, to love, and to keep the word of God, and helping them to live each day with consistency and courage. In silence and in hiddenness, that is to say, in the desert in which I find myself, I am working forcefully that my children consecrated to me believe today in the gospel. Let themselves be guided only by the wisdom of the gospel. Be ever the gospel lived out. This is the task which I have prepared for the army, which I have formed for myself in every part of the world, with my Marian movement of priests, to let themselves be carried with me on the two wings of the great eagle, namely of faith and of charity, receiving with love and living solely in these times of yours the word of God. The great prodigies which I am accomplishing today in the desert in which I find myself are those of transforming completely the life of my little children, that they may become courageous witnesses of faith and luminous examples of holiness. In this way, in silence and in hiddenness, each day I am preparing my great victory over the dragon in the triumph of my immaculate heart in the world. Message number 404, The Huge Red Dragon, Sicily, Italy, May 14th, 1989. Solemnity of Pentecost. Beloved sons, today you adore and call upon the Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost upon the apostles and the disciples gathered together with me in the cynical of Jerusalem. You are calling upon him again in these times of yours with confidence and perseverance gathered together with me in cynicals of prayer which are now spread in every part of the earth. With my Marian movement of priests, I am today inviting all the children of the church to gather together in a continuous cynical of prayer with me, your Heavenly Mother. I am inviting all the bishops, the priests, the religious, and the faithful. My Immaculate Heart is the place of this new spiritual and universal cynical. You must enter into it through your act of consecration, which commits you to me forever so that I may unite my voice to yours in calling down upon the church and upon all humanity the gift of a second Pentecost. Only the Spirit of the Lord can bring back humanity to the perfect glorification of God. Only the Spirit of the Lord can renew the church with the splendor of its unity and its sanctity. Only the Spirit of the Lord can overcome the power and the victorious force of the huge red dragon, which in this century of yours has broken loose everywhere in a formidable way to seduce and ensnare all humanity. The huge red dragon is atheistic communism, which has spread everywhere the error of the denial and of the obstinate rejection of God. The huge red dragon is Marxist atheism, which appears with ten horns, namely with the power of its means of communication in order to lead humanity to disobey the ten commandments of God and with seven heads, upon each of which there is a crown, signs of authority and royalty. The crowned heads indicate the nations in which atheistic communism is established and rules with the force of its ideological, political, and military power. The hugeness of the dragon clearly manifests the vastness of the territory occupied by the uncontested reign of atheistic communism. 
Its color is red because it uses wars and blood as instruments of its numerous conquests. The huge red dragon has succeeded during these years in conquering humanity with the error of theoretical and practical atheism, which has now seduced all the nations of the earth. It has thus succeeded in building up for itself a new civilization without God, materialistic, egoistic, hedonistic, arid, and cold, which carries within itself the seeds of corruption and of death. The huge red dragon has the diabolical task of taking all humanity away from the dominion of God, from the glorification of the Most Holy Trinity, from the full actualization of the plan of the Father, who, by means of the Son, has created it for his glory. The Lord has reclothed me with his light and the Holy Spirit with his divine power, and thus I appear as a great sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, because I have the task of taking humanity away from the dominion of the huge red dragon and bringing it all back to the perfect glorification of the most holy trinity. For this I have formed for myself the army of my littlest children in every part of the world, and I am asking of them that they consecrate themselves to my immaculate heart. Thus I am leading them to live only for the glory of God, by means of faith and charity, and I myself am jealously cultivating them in my heavenly garden. Then each day I present myself before the throne of my Lord in an act of profound adoration. I open the golden door of my immaculate heart, and I offer in my arms all these little children of mine, as I say, Most Holy and Divine Trinity, at the moment when you are being universally denied, I present to you the homage of my motherly reparation by means of all these little ones of mine whom I am forming each day to your greater glorification. Thus again today, from the mouths of infants and sucklings, the Lord receives his perfect praise. Message number 405, The Beast Like a Leopard, Milan, Italy, June 3, 1989, Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, First Saturday. Beloved sons, today you are gathered in cynicals of prayer to celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of your Heavenly Mother. From every part of the world, I have called you to consecrate yourselves to my Immaculate Heart, and you have responded with filial love and generosity. I have now formed for myself my army with those children who have accepted my request and have listened to my voice. The time has come when my Immaculate Heart must be glorified by the Church and by all humanity, because in these times of the apostasy, of the purification, and of the great tribulation, my Immaculate Heart is the only refuge and the way which leads you to the God of salvation and of peace. Above all, my Immaculate Heart becomes today the sign of my sure victory in the great struggle which is being fought out between the followers of the huge red dragon and the followers of the woman clothed with the sun. In this terrible struggle, there comes up from the sea to the aid of the dragon a beast like a leopard. If the red dragon is Marxist atheism, the black beast is Freemasonry. The dragon manifests himself in the force of his power. The black beast, on the other hand, acts in the shadow, keeps out of sight, and hides himself in such a way as to enter in everywhere. He has the claws of a bear and the mouth of a lion, because he works everywhere with cunning and with the means of social communication, that is to say, through propaganda. The seven heads indicate the various Masonic lodges, which act everywhere in a subtle and dangerous way. 
This black beast has ten horns, and on the horns ten crowns, which are signs of dominion and royalty. Masonry rules and governs throughout the whole world by means of the ten horns. The horn in the biblical world has always been an instrument of amplification, a way of making one's voice better heard, a strong means of communication. For this reason, God communicated his will to his people by means of ten horns, which made his law known, the Ten Commandments. The one who accepts them and observes them walks in life along the road of the divine will, of joy and of peace. The one who does the will of the Father accepts the word of his Son and shares in the redemption accomplished by him. Jesus gives to souls the very divine life through grace that he won for us through his sacrifice carried out on Calvary. The grace of the redemption is communicated by means of the seven sacraments. With grace there becomes implanted in the soul the seeds of supernatural life, which are the virtues. Among these, The most important are the three theological and the four cardinal virtues, faith, hope, charity, prudence, fortitude, justice, and temperance. In the divine Son of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, these virtues germinate, grow, become more and more developed, and thus lead the soul along the luminous way of love and of sanctity. The task of the black beast, namely of masonry, is that of fighting, in a subtle way, but tenaciously, to obstruct souls from traveling along this way, pointed out by the Father and the Son, and lighted up by the gifts of the Spirit. In fact, if the red dragon works to bring all humanity to do without God to the denial of God and therefore spreads the air of atheism, The aim of masonry is not to deny God, but to blaspheme him. The beast opens his mouth to utter blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his dwelling place, and against all those who dwell in heaven. The greatest blasphemy is that of denying the worship due to God alone by giving it to creatures and to Satan himself. This is why in these times behind the perverse action of Freemasonry, there are being spread everywhere black masses and the satanic cult. Moreover, Masonry acts by every means to prevent souls from being saved, and thus it endeavors to bring to nothing the redemption accomplished by Christ. If the Lord has communicated his law with the Ten Commandments, Freemasonry spreads everywhere through the power of its ten horns, a law which is completely opposed to that of God. To the commandment of the Lord, you shall not have any other gods but me, it builds other false idols, before which many today prostrate themselves in adoration. To the commandment, you shall not take the name of God in vain, It sets itself up in opposition by blaspheming God and his Christ in many subtle and diabolical ways, even to reducing his name indecorously to the level of a brand name of an object of sale and of producing sacrilegious films concerning his life and his divine person. To the commandment, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day, It transforms the Sunday into a weekend, into a day of sports, of competitions, and of entertainments. To the commandment, honor your father and your mother, it opposes a new model of family based on cohabitation, even between homosexuals. To the commandment, you shall not kill, it has succeeded in making abortion legal everywhere, in making euthanasia acceptable, and in causing respect due to the value of human life, all but disappear. 
to the commandment, you shall not commit impure acts, it justifies, exalts, and propagates every form of impurity, even to the justification of acts against nature. To the commandment, you shall not steal, it works to the end that theft, violence, kidnapping, and robbery spread more and more. To the commandment, you shall not bear false witness. It acts in such a way that the law of deceit, lying, and duplicity become more and more propagated. To the commandment, you shall not covet the goods and the wife of another. It works to corrupt in the depths of the conscious, betraying the mind and the heart of man. In this way, souls become driven along the perverse and wicked road of disobedience to the laws of the Lord, become submerged in sin, and are thus prevented from receiving the gift of grace and the life of God. To the seven theological and cardinal virtues, which are the fruit of living in the grace of God, Freemason recounters with the diffusion of the seven capital vices, which are the fruit of living habitually in the state of sin. To faith, it opposes pride. To hope, lust. To charity, avarice. To prudence, anger. To fortitude, sloth. To justice, envy. To temperance, gluttony. Whoever becomes a victim of the seven capital vices is gradually led to take away the worship that is due to God alone in order to give it to false divinities who are the very personification of all these vices. And in this consists the greatest and most horrible blasphemy. This is why on every head of the beast there is written a blasphemous name. Each Masonic Lodge has the task of making a different divinity adored. The first head bears the blasphemous name of pride, which opposes itself to the virtue of faith and leads one to offer worship to the God of human reason and haughtiness, of technology and progress. The second head bears the blasphemous name of lust which opposes itself to the virtue of hope and brings one to offer worship to the God of sexuality and of impurity. The third head bears the blasphemous name of avarice, which opposes itself to the virtue of charity and spreads everywhere the worship of the God of money. The fourth head bears the blasphemous name of anger, which opposes itself to the virtue of prudence and leads one to offer worship to the God of discord and division. The fifth head bears the blasphemous name of sloth, which opposes itself to the virtue of fortitude, and disseminates the worship of the idol of fear, of public opinion, and of exploitation. The sixth head bears the blasphemous name of envy, which opposes itself to the virtue of justice and leads one to offer worship to the idol of violence and of war. The seventh head bears the blasphemous name of gluttony, which opposes itself to the virtue of temperance and leads one to offer worship to the so highly extolled idol of hedonism, of materialism, and of pleasure. The task of the Masonic Lodges is that of working today with great astuteness to bring humanity everywhere to disdain the holy law of God, to work an open opposition to the Ten Commandments, and to take away the worship due to God alone in order to offer it to certain false idols, which become extolled and adored by an ever-increasing number of people, reason, flesh, money, discord, domination, violence, pleasure. Thus, souls are precipitated into the dark slavery of evil, of vice, and of sin, and at the moment of death and of the judgment of God into the pool of eternal fire, 
which is hell. Now you understand how in these times, against the terrible and insidious attack of the black beast, namely of masonry, my immaculate heart becomes your refuge and the sure road which brings you to God. In my immaculate heart, there is delineated the tactic made use of by your heavenly mother to fight back against and to defeat the subtle plot made use of by the black beast. For this reason, I am training all my children to observe the Ten Commandments of God, to live the gospel to the letter, to make frequent use of the sacraments, especially those of penance and Eucharistic communion, as necessary helps in order to remain in the grace of God, to practice the virtues vigorously, to walk along the path of goodness, of love, of purity, and of holiness. Thus I am making use of you, my little children, who have consecrated yourselves to me, to unmask all these subtle snares which the black beast sets for you, and to make futile in the end the great attack which masonry has launched today against Christ and his church. And in the end, especially in his greatest defeat, there will appear in all its splendor the triumph of my immaculate heart in the world. Number 406. The Beast Like a Lamb. Dongo, Como, Italy, June 13, 1989. Anniversary of the Second Apparition at Fatima. Beloved sons, today you are calling to mind my second apparition, which took place in the humble Cova da Iria in Fatima on June 13, 1917. Even as of then, I foretold to you that which you are living through in these times. I announced to you the great struggle between me, the woman clothed with the sun, and the huge red dragon which has brought humanity to live without God. I also foretold to you the subtle and dark work carried out by Freemasonry with the purpose of separating you from the observance of the law of God and thus making you victims of sins and of vices. Above all, as mother, I have wanted to warn you of the grave dangers which threaten the church today because of the many and diabolical attacks which are being carried out against it to destroy it. To attain this end, there comes out of the earth, by way of aid to the black beast which arises out of the sea, a beast which has two horns like those of a lamb. The lamb, in Holy Scripture, has always been a symbol of sacrifice. On the night of the Exodus, the lamb is sacrificed, and with its blood the doorposts of the houses of the Hebrews are sprinkled in order to remove them from the punishment which, on the contrary, strikes all the Egyptians." The Hebrew Pash recalls this fact each year through the immolation of a lamb which is sacrificed and consumed. On Calvary, Jesus Christ sacrifices himself for the redemption of humanity. He himself becomes our Pash and becomes the true Lamb of God who takes away all the sins of the world. The beast has on its head two horns like those of a lamb. To the symbol of the sacrifice, there is intimately connected that of the priesthood, the two horns. The high priest of the Old Testament wore a headpiece with two horns. The bishops of the church wear the mitre with two horns to indicate the fullness of their priesthood. The black beast, like a leopard, indicates Freemasonry. The beast with the two horns, like a lamb, indicates Freemasonry infiltrated into the interior of the church, that is to say, ecclesiastical masonry, which has spread especially among the members of the hierarchy. This Masonic infiltration in the interior of the church was already foretold to you by me at Fatima when I announced to you that Satan would enter in even to the summit of the church. If the task of Masonry is to lead souls to perdition, bringing them to the worship of false divinities, the task of ecclesiastical masonry, on the other hand, is that of destroying Christ and his church, building a new idol, namely a false Christ and a false church. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. He is the word incarnate. He is true God and true man because he unites in his divine person human nature and divine nature. 
Jesus in the gospel has given his most complete definition of himself, saying that he is the truth, the way, and the life. Jesus is the truth because he reveals the Father to us, speaks his definitive word to us, and brings all divine revelation to its perfect fulfillment. Jesus is the life because he gives us divine life itself with the grace merited by him through redemption. And he institutes the sacraments as efficacious means which communicate grace. Jesus is the way which leads to the Father by means of the gospel which he has given us as the way to follow to attain salvation. Jesus is the truth because it is he, the living word, who is the font and seal of all divine revelation. And so, ecclesiastical masonry works to obscure his divine word by means of natural and rational interpretations and, in the attempt to make it more understandable and acceptable, empties it of all its supernatural content. Thus, errors are spread in every part of the Catholic Church itself. Because of the spread of these errors, many are moving away today from the true faith, bringing to fulfillment the prophecy which was given to you by me at Fatima. The times will come when many will lose the true faith. The loss of the faith is apostasy. Ecclesiastical masonry works in a subtle and diabolical way to lead all into apostasy. Jesus is the life because he gives grace. The aim of ecclesiastical masonry is that of justifying sin, of presenting it no longer as an evil, but as something good and of value. Thus, one is advised to do this as a way of satisfying the exigencies of one's own nature, destroying the root from which repentance could be born, and it is told that it is no longer necessary to confess it. The pernicious fruit of this accursed cancer, which has spread throughout the whole church, is the disappearance everywhere of individual confession. Souls are led to live in sin, rejecting the gift of life which Jesus has offered us. Jesus is the way which leads to the Father by means of the gospel. Ecclesiastical masonry favors those forms of exegesis which give it a rationalistic and natural interpretation by means of the application of the various literary genres in such a way that it becomes torn to pieces in all its parts. In the end, one arrives at denying the historical reality of miracles and of the resurrection and places in doubt the very divinity of Jesus and his salvific mission. After having destroyed the historical Christ, the beast with the two horns like a lamb seeks to destroy the mystical Christ, which is the church. The church instituted by Christ is one and one alone. It is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church founded on Peter. As is Jesus, so too is the church founded by him, which forms his mystical body, truth, life, and and way. The church is truth because Jesus has entrusted to it alone the task of guarding in its integrity all the deposit of faith. He has entrusted it to the hierarchical church, that is to say, to the Pope and to the bishops united with him. Ecclesiastical masonry seeks to destroy this reality through false ecumenism, which leads to the acceptance of all Christian churches, asserting that each one of them has some part of the truth. It develops the plan of founding a universal ecumenical church formed by the fusion of all the Christian confessions, among which the Catholic Church. The church is life because it gives grace, and it alone possesses the efficacious means of grace, which are the seven sacraments. Especially it is life because to it alone is given the power to beget the Eucharist by means of the hierarchical and ministerial priesthood. In the Eucharist, Jesus Christ is truly present with his glorified body and his divinity. And so ecclesiastical masonry in many and subtle ways seeks to attack the ecclesial devotion towards the sacrament of the Eucharist. It gives value only to the meal aspect tends to minimize its sacrificial value, seeks to deny the real and personal presence of Jesus in the consecrated host. 
In this way, there are gradually suppressed all the external signs which are indicative of faith in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, such as genuflections, hours of public adoration, and the holy custom of surrounding the tabernacle with lights and flowers. The church is the way because it leads to the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit along the way of perfect unity. As the Father and the Son are one, so too must you be one among yourselves. Jesus has willed that his church be a sign and an instrument of the unity of the whole human race. The church succeeds in being united because it has been founded on the cornerstone of its unity, Peter, and the Pope who succeeds to the charism of Peter. And so, ecclesiastical masonry seeks to destroy the foundation of the unity of the church through a subtle and insidious attack on the Pope. It weaves plots of dissension and of contestation against the Pope. It supports and rewards those who vilify and disobey him. It disseminates the criticisms and the contentions of bishops and theologians. In this way, the very foundation of its unity is demolished, and thus the church becomes more and more torn and divided. Beloved children, I have urged you to consecrate yourselves to my immaculate heart and to enter into this my motherly refuge, above all in order to be preserved and defended against this terrible snare. In this way, through the act of consecration of my movement, I have urged you to renounce every aspiration of building up a career. Thus, you will be able to remove yourselves from the strongest and most dangerous snare made use of by masonry in order to associate in its secret sects so many of my beloved children. I bring you to a great love for Jesus, truth making you courageous witnesses of the faith to Jesus, life leading you to great holiness, to Jesus, way asking you to be in life, the gospel alone lived out and proclaimed to the letter. Then I lead you to the greatest love for the church. I bring you to love the church truth, making of you strong proclaimers of all the truths of the Catholic faith as you set yourself in opposition with strength and courage to all errors. I make of you ministers of the church life, helping you to be faithful and holy priests. Be always available for the needs of souls. Lend yourselves with generous abnegation to the ministry of reconciliation and be burning flames of love and of zeal for Jesus present in the Eucharist. In your churches, may you once again hold frequent hours of public adoration and reparation to the most holy sacrament of the altar. I transform you into witnesses of the church way, and I make of you precious instruments of its unity. For this reason, I have given you as a second pledge of my movement a special unity with the Pope. By means of your love and of your fidelity, the divine plan of perfect unity in the church will once again shine forth in all its splendor. Thus, to the dark force which ecclesiastical masonry is today exercising to destroy Christ and his church. I am opposing the powerful splendor of my priestly and faithful army so that Christ may be loved, listened to, and followed by all, and that his church may be more and more loved, defended, and sanctified. In this there shines forth above all the victory of the woman clothed with the sun and my immaculate heart attains its most luminous triumph. Number 407, the number of the beast, 666. Milan, Italy, June 17, 1989. Beloved sons, you now understand the plan of your heavenly mother, the woman clothed with the sun, who with her army is engaged in the great struggle against all the forces of evil in order to attain her great victory in the perfect glorification of the most holy trinity. Join me in battle, little children, against the dragon who seeks to lead all humanity against God. Join me in battle, little children, against the black beast, masonry, which seeks to lead souls to perdition. Join me in battle, little children, against the beast like a lamb, Masonry infiltrated into the interior of ecclesial life in order to destroy Christ and his church. To attain this end, it seeks to build a new idol, namely a false Christ and a false church. 
ecclesiastical masonry receives orders and power from the various Masonic lodges and works to lead everyone secretly to become part of these secret sects. Thus, it stimulates the ambitious with the prospects of easy careers. It heaps up with goods, those who are starved for money. It assists its members to exceed others and to occupy the most important positions while it sets aside, in a subtle but decisive way, all those who refuse to take part in its designs. Indeed, the beast, like a lamb, exercises all its power from the first beast in its presence, and it forces the earth and all its inhabitants to adore the first beast. Ecclesiastical masonry goes as far as even building a statue in honor of the beast and forces all to adore this statue. But according to the first commandment of the holy law of the Lord, only God is to be adored, and to him alone must every form of worship be rendered. And so they substitute for God a strong, powerful, and dominating idol, an idol so powerful that it puts to death all who do not adore the statue of the beast, an idol so strong and dominating as to cause all, small and great, rich and poor, free men and slaves, to receive a mark on the right hand and on the forehead, and that no one can buy or sell without having this mark, that is to say, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This great idol, built to be served and adored by all, as I have already revealed to you in the preceding, but what is its name? In the 13th chapter of the Apocalypse, it is written, This calls for wisdom. Let him who has understanding reckon the number of the beast. It represents a human name, and the number in question is 666, 666, Revelations 13, 18. With intelligence illumined by the light of divine wisdom, one can succeed in deciphering from the number 666 the name of a man, and this name, indicated by such a number, is that of the Antichrist. Lucifer, the ancient serpent, the devil or Satan, the red dragon, becomes, in these last times, the Antichrist. The Apostle John already affirmed that whoever denies that Jesus Christ is God, that person is the Antichrist. The statue or idol built in honor of the beast to be adored by all men is the Antichrist. Calculate now its number, 666, to understand how it indicates the name of a man. The number 333 indicates the divinity. Lucifer rebels against God through pride because he wants to put himself above God. 333 is the number which indicates the mystery of God. He who wants to put himself above God bears the sign 666, and consequently, this number indicates the name of Lucifer, Satan, that is to say, of him who sets himself against Christ, of the Antichrist. 333, indicated once, that is to say, for the first time, expresses the mystery of the unity of God. 333, indicated twice, that is to say, for the second time, indicates the two natures, that of the divine and the human, united in the divine person of Jesus Christ. 333 indicated thrice, that is to say, for the third time, indicates the mystery of the three divine persons, that is to say, it expresses the mystery of the most holy trinity. Thus, the number 333, expressed one, two, and three times, expresses the principal mysteries of the Catholic faith, which are, one, the unity and the trinity of God, two, the incarnation, the passion and death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. If 333 is the number of which indicates the divinity, he who wants to put himself above God himself is referred to by the number 666. 666 indicated once, that is to say, for the first time, expresses the year 666, 666. In this period of history, the Antichrist is manifested through the phenomenon of Islam, which directly denies the mystery of the divine trinity and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Islamism, with its military force, breaks loose everywhere, destroying all the ancient Christian communities and invades Europe. And it is only through my extraordinary motherly intervention, begged for powerfully by the Holy Father, that it does not succeed in destroying Christianity completely. 666 indicated twice, that is to say for the second time, expresses the year 1332, 1332. In this period of history, the Antichrist is manifested through a radical attack on the faith in the Word of God. Through the philosophers who begin to give exclusive value to science and then to reason, there is a gradual tendency to constitute human intelligence alone as the sole criterion of truth. There come to birth the great philosophical errors which continue through the centuries down to your days. The exaggerated importance given to reason as an exclusive criterion of truth necessarily leads to the destruction of the faith in the Word of God. Indeed, with the Protestant Reformation, tradition is rejected as a source of divine revelation and only sacred scripture is accepted. But even this must be interpreted by means of the reason and the authentic magisterium of the hierarchical church to which Christ has entrusted the guardianship of the deposit of the faith is obstinately rejected. Each one is free to read and understand sacred scripture according to one's personal interpretation. In this way, faith in the word of God is destroyed. The work of the Antichrist in this period of history is the division of the church and the consequent formation of new and numerous Christian confessions which gradually become driven to a more and more extensive loss of the true faith in the word of God. 666 indicated thrice, that is to say for the third time, expresses the year 1998. 1998. In this period of history, Freemasonry, assisted by its ecclesiastical form, will succeed in its great design, that of setting up an idol to put in the place of Christ and of his church, a false Christ and a false church. Consequently, the statue built in honor of the first beast to be adored by all the inhabitants of the earth and which will seal with its mark all those who want to buy or sell is that of the Antichrist. You have thus arrived at the peak of the purification of the great tribulation and of the apostasy. The apostasy will be, as of then, generalized because almost all will follow the false Christ and the false church. Then the door will open for the appearance of the man or of the very person of the Antichrist. This is why, beloved children, I have wanted to enlighten you concerning the pages of the Apocalypse which refer to the times you are living through. This is to prepare you with me for the most painful and decisive part of the great struggle which is on the point of being fought out between your Heavenly Mother and all the forces of evil which have been let loose. Take courage. Be strong, my little children. To you befalls the duty in these difficult years of remaining faithful to Christ and to his church, putting up with hostility, struggle, and persecution. But you are a precious part of the little flock which has the task of fighting against and in the end of conquering the powerful force of the Antichrist. I am forming you all, defending you, and blessing you. Number 408, bear within yourselves the witness of Jesus. Valdragone Samarino, June 28, 1989. Spiritual exercises in the form of a cenacle with the priests of the Marian movement of priests from America and Europe. Beloved sons, with what love I look at you and how my sorrowful heart is consoled by this continuous cenacle of yours, which renews here the reality of that of Jerusalem. You are gathering together in prayer, which is continuous, intense, and made with me. How pleasing to me is the prayer of the liturgy of the hours, the entire rosary which you recite, the Eucharistic adoration, and the solemn concelebration of Mass, which forms the heart of the entire Seneca. You are united as brothers who love each other and who help each other to carry together the burden of the difficulties which you encounter. 
You renew each day your act of consecration to my immaculate heart in diverse languages, and thus you truly unite yourselves to all your brothers of my movement who are spread throughout every part of the world. You are part of my army. You are a precious portion of my maternal heritage. You bear within yourselves the witness of Jesus, and you observe the commandments of God. Satan unleashes himself against you. Because you form my heel, that is the weakest and most fragile part of me. And because you are my offspring, thus today he lies in ambush for you in a powerful manner, and he unleashes himself against you with every sort of temptation and persecution. Remain serene. Have confidence in me. These are the times of the battle, and you must fight for my victory. Because of this, I invite you all to bear within yourselves the witness of Jesus. Bear within yourselves the witness of Jesus in these times of the purification, in order to walk along the road of fidelity to Christ and to his church, and of an even ever greater holiness. Thus you will remain in security and peace, in trust and in filial abandonment to me. Bear within yourselves the witness of Jesus in these times of the apostasy in order to be strong and courageous witnesses of faith. For this, I invite you to be ever more united to the Pope, to sustain him with your prayer and with your love, to accept and spread his teaching. In this way, you will indicate to souls the secure way to follow in order to remain in the true faith. Maintain the witness of Jesus in these times of the Great Tribulation. The days foretold by the gospel and the apocalypse have arrived. The forces of evil, united by the power of the one who opposes himself to Christ, will perform great prodigies in heaven and on the earth in order to thus seduce a great part of humanity. You must remain solid in your heroic witness to Jesus and fight with me against the powerful force of him who manifests himself as the enemy of Christ. In the end, you will be able to contemplate with joy my great victory in the glorious triumph of Christ. I bless you all with your dear ones, the souls confided to your care, your priestly ministry, and I gather in my hands all the good intentions you carry in your heart. Number 409. Here must appear the constancy of the saints. Rubio, Vicenza, Italy, August 15, 1989. Solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into Heaven Today look to me, your Heavenly Mother, in the splendor of my glorified body assumed, with my soul, into the glory of Paradise. I am the woman clothed with the sun. I am your Heavenly Leader. I am the Queen of all the Saints. Look to me as a sign of sure hope and of consolation in these times of the purification, of the apostasy and of the Great Tribulation. The times of the struggle and the greatest conquest on the part of the dragon of the beast which comes up from the earth and of the beast which comes up from the sea have come. These are therefore the times when a civilization without God is being constructed and all humanity is being led to live without him. These are the times when Satan and the diabolic forces are making themselves adored by an ever-increasing number of men, and thus the spread of the satanic cult, of the sects, and of the black masses is becoming vaster. These are the times when an idol is being built to be put in the place of the true God and of the true church, and this idol is a false Christ and a false church. These are the times when all those who will follow this idol will be signed with its mark on the forehead and on the hand. These are the times when the faithful followers of the Lamb will be subjected to marginalization, to persecutions, to prison, and to death. These are, therefore, the times of your constancy. Here must appear the constancy of the saints. Here must appear the constancy of those who belong to the Lord, who put into practice the commandments of God, and who remain faithful to Jesus. Here must appear the constancy of those who will be persecuted and led to martyrdom, because blessed are they who die in the Lord, who find rest from their labors, and the good that they have done accompanies them. Here must appear the constancy of those who do not adore the beast 
and who will not allow themselves to be signed with his diabolical mark. Those, on the other hand, who will adore the beast and its statue and will receive its mark on the forehead and on the hand, will drink the wine of the wrath of God, poured out from the chalice of his terrible chastisement, and will be tortured in the presence of the Lamb and of the holy angels with fire and sulfur. Here must appear the constancy of those who bear, written upon their foreheads, the name of the Lamb and the name of his Father, because they have not betrayed their God, there has never been a lie in their speech, and they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Here must appear the constancy of all my little children, whom I am calling to consecrate themselves to my immaculate heart, to live out with me the conclusive moments of the battle and of the fall of Babylon. When the vintage of the earth will be harvested and the grapes will be cast into the winepress, which represents the great chastisement of God. For this reason, I invite you all today to look to me, your heavenly mother, in the splendor of my glorified body, that my light may illumine you, my immaculate heart enfold you, and my motherly love support you to be in these times courageous witnesses of constancy before the church and before all humanity. Number 410, the mark on the forehead and on the hand. Dongo, Como, Italy, September 8, 1989. Feast of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Today is the feast of the birth of your heavenly mother, my dear beloved ones and children consecrated to my immaculate heart. Live it in joy and in peace, in silence and in prayer, in confidence and in filial abandonment. You are the little infants of your infant mother. You are part of my progeny and a strong point of my victorious plan. You form a precious crown of purity, of love, and of humility about the cradle in which I am placed. Allow yourselves to be nourished and formed by me. Allow yourselves to be led by me with docility. Allow yourselves to be signed by me with my motherly seal. These are the times when the followers of him who opposes himself to Christ are being signed with his mark on the forehead and on the hand. The mark on the forehead and on the hand is an expression of a total dependency on the part of those who are designated by this sign. The sign indicates him who is an enemy of Christ, that is to say, the sign of the Antichrist, and his mark, which is stamped, signifies the complete belonging of the person thus marked to the army of him who is opposed to Christ and who fights against his divine and royal dominion. The mark is imprinted on the forehead and on the hand. The forehead indicates the intellect because the mind is the seat of the human reason. The hand expresses human activity because it is with his hands that man acts and works. Nevertheless, it is the person who is marked with the mark of the Antichrist in his intellect and in his will. He who allows himself to be signed with the mark on his forehead is led to accept the doctrine of the denial of God, of the rejection of his law, and of atheism, which, in these times, is more and more diffused and advertised. And thus he is driven to follow the ideologies in mode today and to make of himself a propagator of all the errors. He who allows himself to be signed with the mark on his hand is obliged to act in an autonomous manner and independently of God, ordering his own activities to the quest of a purely material and terrestrial good. Thus he withdraws his action from the design of the Father, who wants to illumine it and sustain it by his divine providence. From the love of the Son, who makes human toil a precious means for one's own redemption and sanctification, from the power of the Spirit, who acts everywhere to renew interiorly every creature. He who is signed with the mark on his hand works for himself alone to accumulate material goods, to make money his God, and becomes a victim of materialism. He who is signed with the mark on his hand works solely for the gratification of his own senses, for the quest of well-being and pleasure, for the granting of full satisfaction to all his passions, especially that of impurity, and he becomes a victim of hedonism. 
He who is signed with the mark on his hand makes of his own self the center of all his actions, looks upon others as objects to be used and to be exploited for his own advantage, and he becomes a victim of unbridled egoism and of lovelessness. If my adversary is signing with his mark all his followers, the time has come when I also, your heavenly leader, am signing with my motherly seal all those who have consecrated themselves to my immaculate heart and have formed part of my army. I am imprinting my seal on your foreheads with the most holy sign of the cross of my son Jesus. Thus, I am opening the human intellect to receive his divine word, to love it and to live it. I am leading you to entrust yourselves completely to Jesus who has revealed it to you. And I am making of you today courageous witnesses of faith. Against those signed on the forehead with the blasphemous mark, I am opposing my children signed with the cross of Jesus Christ. And then I am directing all your activity to the perfect glorification of the most holy trinity. For this, I am imprinting upon your hands my seal, which is the sign of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. With the sign of the Father, your human activity becomes directed towards a perfect cooperation with the plans of his divine providence, which still today arranges all things for your good. With the sign of the Son, all your actions become profoundly inserted into the mystery of his divine redemption. With the sign of the Holy Spirit, Everything you do becomes open to his powerful force for sanctification, which breathes everywhere like a powerful fire to renew from its foundations the whole world. My beloved children, allow yourselves all to be signed on the forehead and on the hand with my motherly seal. On this day, when gathered with love about my cradle, you celebrate the feast of the earthly birth of your heavenly mother. Number 411, Great is My Sorrow, Fatima, Portugal, September 15th, 1989, Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. Share, beloved sons, in my sorrow. I am your sorrowful mother. My immaculate heart is being pierced with numerous and painful thorns. The dominion of my adversary is becoming daily greater and greater, and his power is expanding in hearts and in souls. A dense darkness has now descended upon the world. It is the darkness of the obstinate rejection of God. It is the darkness of sin, committed, justified, and no longer confessed. It is the darkness of lust and of impurity. It is the darkness of unbridled egoism and of hatred, of division, and of war. It is the darkness of the loss of faith and of apostasy. In the chalice of my immaculate heart, I am gathering again today all the pain of my son Jesus, who is mystically again living through the bloody hours of his agony. A new Gethsemane for Jesus is to see today his church so violated and deserted, where the greater part of its pastors are sleeping in indifference and in tepidity, while others repeat the act of Judas and betray it out of thirst for power and for money. The dragon is exulting at the vastness of his conquest with the help of the black beast and the beast like a lamb. In these days of yours, when the devil has unleashed himself upon you, knowing that there is little time left him. For this reason, the days of my greatest sorrow have also arrived. Great is my sorrow in seeing my son Jesus again despised and scourged in his word, rejected because of pride and lacerated through human and rationalistic interpretations. Great is my sorrow in contemplating Jesus, really present in the Eucharist, more and more forgotten, abandoned, offended, and trampled upon. Great is my sorrow in seeing my church, divided, betrayed, stripped, and crucified. Great is my sorrow in seeing my Pope, who is succumbing under the weight of a most heavy cross, as he is being surrounded with complete indifference on the part of bishops, priests, and faithful. Great is my sorrow for an ever vaster number of my poor children who are running along the road of evil and of sin, of vice and of impurity, 
of egoism and of hatred with the great danger of being eternally lost in hell. And so I am asking you today, children, consecrated to my Immaculate Heart, that which, in this very place in May 1917, I asked of my three little children, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco, to whom I appeared, do you also want to offer yourselves as victims to the Lord on the altar of my Immaculate Heart for the salvation of all my poor sinful children? If you accept this request of mine, you must do what I now ask of you. Pray ever more and more, especially with the Holy Rosary. Make frequent hours of adoration and of Eucharistic reparation. Accept with love all the sufferings which the Lord sends you. Spread without fear the message which I am giving you as heavenly prophetess of these last times of yours. If you only knew the chastisement of which awaits you, if you again close the door of your hearts to the anguished voice of your heavenly mother, because the divine heart of my son Jesus has entrusted to my immaculate heart the last and extreme attempt to lead you all to salvation. Number 412, The Angel of the First Plague. Dongo, Como, Italy, October 13, 1989, Anniversary of the Last Apparition at Fatima. You are recalling today my last apparition, which took place at Fatima on the 13th of October, 1917, confirmed by the miracle of the sun. Look more and more to the woman clothed with the sun, who has the task of preparing the church and humanity for the coming of the great day of the Lord. The times of the decisive battle have come. The hour of the great tribulation has now descended upon the world because the angels of the Lord are being sent with their plagues to chastise the earth. How many times have I urged you to walk along the road of mortification of the senses, of mastery over the passions, of modesty, of good example, of purity, and of holiness? But humanity has not accepted my urging and has continued to disobey the sixth commandment of the law of the Lord, which prescribes that one shall not commit impure acts. On the contrary, it has sought to exalt such a transgression and to put it forward as the acquisition of a human value and a new way of exercising one's own personal freedom. Thus, today, it has reached the point of legitimating as good all the sins of impurity. It has begun to corrupt the consciences of little children and of youth, bringing them to the conviction that impure acts committed by oneself are no longer sins that relations before marriage between those engaged is licit and good, that families may behave as they please and may also make use of the various means of birth control, and they have come to the justification and the exaltation of impure acts against nature and even to the proposing of laws which put homosexual cohabitation on a par with marriage. Never, as today, have immorality, impurity, and obscenity been so continually propagandized through the press and all the means of social communication. Above all, television has become the perverse instrument of a daily bombardment with obscene images directed to corrupt the purity of the mind and the heart of all. The places of entertainment, in particular the cinema and the discotheques, have become places of public profanation of one's human and Christian dignity. This is the time when the Lord our God is being continually and publicly offended by the sins of the flesh. Holy Scripture has already warned you that those who sin by means of the flesh find their just punishment in that same flesh. And so the time has come when the angel of the first plague is passing over the world, that it might be chastised according to the will of God. The angel of the first plague cuts into the flesh of those who have allowed themselves to be signed with the mark of the monster on the forehead and on the hand and have adored his image. With a painful and malignant wound, which causes those who have been stricken by it to cry out in desperation. This wound represents the physical pain which strikes the body by means of grave and incurable maladies. The painful and malignant wound 
is a plague for all humanity today so perverted, which has built up an atheistic and materialistic civilization and has made the quest for pleasure the supreme aim of human life. Some of my poor children have been stricken by it because of their sins of impurity and their disordered morals, and they carry within their own selves the weight of the evil they have done. Others, on the other hand, have been stricken, even though they are good and innocent, and so their suffering serves for the salvation of many of the wicked in virtue of the solidarity which unites you all. The first plague is that of malignant tumors and every kind of cancer, against which science can do nothing notwithstanding its progress in every field. Maladies which spread more and more and strike the human body, devastating it with most painful and malignant wounds. Beloved children, think of the spread of these incurable maladies throughout every part of the world and of the millions of deaths which they are bringing about. The first plague is the new malady of AIDS, which strikes above all my poor children who are victims of drugs, of vices, and of impure sins against nature. Your Heavenly Mother wants to be a help, a support, a comfort, and a source of hope for all. In these times when humanity is being stricken by this first plague, for this I urge you all to walk along the road of fasting, of mortification, and of penance. Of little children, I ask that they grow in the virtue of purity and, in this difficult journey, let them be assisted by their parents and teachers. Of the youth, I ask that they form themselves in the control of the passions through prayer and a life of union with me, and that they renounce going to the cinema and the discotheques, where there exists the grave and continuous danger of offending this virtue, which is so dear to my immaculate heart. Of engaged couples, I ask that they abstain from all relations before marriage. Of Christian husbands and wives, I ask that they form themselves in the exercise of conjugal chastity and never make use of artificial means of birth control as they follow the teaching of Christ, which the church still puts forth today with enlightened wisdom. How very much I ask of priests the scrupulous observance of celibacy and of religious, the faithful and austere practice of their vow of chastity. To my poor children, stricken by the first plague of the painful and malignant wound, I present myself as a merciful mother who assuages and comforts, who brings to hope and to peace. Of these, I ask that they offer their sufferings in a spirit of reparation, of purification, and of sanctification. Above all, for them, my immaculate heart becomes the most welcome refuge and the sure road that leads them to the God of salvation and of joy. In this, my heavenly garden, all will be consoled and encouraged while I myself personally and lovingly take care to give consolation in suffering and, if it be in the will of the Lord, to offer the gift of healing. Consequently, in this time when humanity is being stricken by the first plague, I urge you all to look to me, your Heavenly Mother, that you may be comforted and assisted. Number 413, The New Jerusalem, Dango, Como, Italy, November 1st, 1989, Solemnity of All Saints. Today is the Feast of All Saints, and tomorrow you remember those who are saved, but who are still immersed in the purifying suffering of purgatory. In these times of the great tribulation, the communion of saints must be lived vigorously by you. I am the queen of all saints. I am the leader of one single army. To all the snares which the dragon, the black beast, the beast like a lamb, and the evil spirits set for you every day, the angels of the Lord have from me the task of responding with force and power. How great today is their heavenly power, because they are being sent by me to fight back the tactic of my adversary, which is that of leading many of my poor children away from the adoration that is due to our God. By the ever greater spread of the satanic cult and of the black masses, to this perverse and blasphemous action of the demons, the angels respond with their perennial, profound, and incessant act of adoration and of glorification of the Lord. To the dangers which, in these times, the wicked set for you, seeking to strew with obstacles, with difficulties, and with subtle opposition, the road along which you must walk, 
the saints in paradise respond with their powerful assistance and intercession. The hidden and obscure plots which masonry sets against you to make you fall into its net are revealed and destroyed by the saints who cause to come down from paradise a strong light which surrounds you to make your whole life fragrant with the perfume of faith, of hope, of love, of purity, and of holiness. The communion of life with the saints of paradise is the remedy which I am giving you against the subtle and very insidious dangers which today the black beast of masonry is setting for you. Against the difficulties, the acts of derision, and the marginalization which the beast like a lamb uses against you, my beloved children have recourse to a perpetual communion of prayer with the holy souls in purgatory. This communion of prayer with the souls who are being purified gives to them the light and the comfort of shortening the time of their purification and grants to you the security and the courage to carry out my plan in your life, which is that of helping you to fulfill at each moment the divine will of the Lord. Today I am contemplating you with joy, gathered together in the heavenly garden of my Immaculate Heart, to live this stupendous reality of the communion of saints, which unites you, helps you, and pledges you all to fight for the full triumph of Christ. In the coming upon the world of his glorious reign of love, of holiness, of justice, and of peace. Thus you are already contributing to the forming of the new Jerusalem, the holy city, which must come down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband, and you are forming the dwelling place of God among men, that all may become his people, where every tear will be wiped from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death or strife or mourning or anguish, because the former things have passed away. Number 414 a crown of 12 stars. Rubio, Vicenza, Italy, December 8, 1989. Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. Beloved sons, today you are gazing upon the immaculate splendor of your heavenly mother. I am the immaculate conception. I am the only creature free from every stain of sin, even the original one. I am all beautiful, toto pulcra. Let yourselves be enfolded by my mantle of beauty that you too may be illumined by my heavenly splendor, by my immaculate light. I am all beautiful because I am called to be the mother of the Son of God and to form the virginal shoot from which the divine flower shall blossom. For this reason, my purpose is included in the very mystery of your salvation. At the beginning, I am announced as the enemy of Satan. She who will obtain the complete victory over him, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. She will crush your head as you will attempt to bite her heel. Genesis 3.15 At the end, I am seen as the woman clothed with the sun, who has the task of fighting against the red dragon and his powerful army to conquer him, to bind him, and to drive him away into his kingdom of death that Christ alone may reign over the world. Behold me then, presented by sacred scripture in the splendor of my maternal royalty. And another sign appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Revelations 12, 1. About my head there is therefore a crown of 12 stars. The crown is the sign of royalty. It is composed of 12 stars because it becomes the symbol of my maternal and royal presence in the very heart of the people of God. The 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel, which compose the chosen people, selected and called by the Lord to prepare for the coming into the world of the Son of God, the Redeemer. Because I am called to become the mother of the Messiah, my purpose is that of being the fulfillment of the promises, the virginal shoot, the honor and the glory of all the people of Israel. In fact, the church exalts me with these words. You are the glory of Jerusalem. You are the joy of Israel. You are the honor of our people. For this, the tribes of Israel form 12 precious gems of the crown, which surrounds my head to indicate the function of my maternal royalty. 
The 12 stars also signify the 12 apostles, who are the foundation upon which Christ has founded his church. I was often with them to encourage them to follow and to believe in Jesus during the three years of his public mission. In their place, together with John, I stood beneath the cross at the moment of the crucifixion, of the agony and of the death of my son Jesus. With them, I took part in the joy of his resurrection, at their side recollected in prayer. I assisted at the glorious moment of Pentecost. During my earthly life, I remained at their side with my prayer and my motherly presence to help them, to form them, to encourage them and to urge them on to drink the chalice which had been prepared for them by the Heavenly Father. I am thus mother and queen of the apostles who about my head form 12 luminous stars of my maternal royalty. I am mother and queen of all the church. The 12 stars also signify a new reality. Indeed, the apocalypse sees me as a great sign in heaven, the woman clothed with the sun who does battle with the dragon and his powerful army of evil. And so the stars about my head indicate those who consecrate themselves to my immaculate heart, who form part of my victorious army and who allow themselves to be guided by me in order to fight this battle and to attain in the end our greatest victory. Thus, all my beloved ones and children consecrated to my immaculate heart, called to be today the apostles of the last times, are the most luminous stars of my royal crown. The twelve stars which form the luminous crown of my maternal royalty are made up of the tribes of Israel, of the apostles, and of the apostles of these last times of yours. And so, on the feast of my immaculate conception, I am calling you all to form a precious part of my crown and to become the brilliant stars which spread the light, the grace, the holiness, the beauty, and the glory of your heavenly mother throughout every part. Number 415. The time has reached its fullness. Dongo, Como, Italy, December 24th, 1989, The Holy Night. Beloved sons, Live these hours of the holy night with me in an act of unceasing prayer and of profound recollection. The time has reached its fullness. For hundreds of years, this event had been awaited. The voices of prophets and of envoys from God had kept the torch of hope and of expectation burning. The course of time and of history all flowed toward this extraordinary moment. On this holy night, everything has its fulfillment. I, virgin and mother, bring forth my divine son. My most chaste spouse, Joseph, is at my side and brings in his person the presence of all the poor of Israel. The barren cave becomes a royal palace for the son of David, called to sit upon his royal throne. The shepherds hasten to offer the homage of the simple and of the poor in spirit. The choir of angels sings and brings the innocent light of infants, of little ones, of the pure of heart. With how much ineffable love and delicate tenderness I place my divine son in the poor manger, the firstborn of the new people of Israel, the only begotten son of the Father, the Messiah, promised and expected for centuries. On this holy night, the prophecies are realized and everything attains its perfect fulfillment. The time has reached its fullness. Live this Christmas with love, with confidence and with great hope. It is the Christmas of 1989. It is the Christmas of a year that has been very important. Live it with me, the mother who each day brings you forth to that life which my child has given you through his coming into your midst. Live it with my spouse Joseph in an act of humble and docile collaboration with the plan of your heavenly father. Live it with the shepherds who hasten jubilantly in the joy that you too are witnesses to the announcement, which again today proclaims peace and salvation to all men. Live it with the little, the simple, the poor, who form a royal throne for the reign of my son Jesus. 
Live it with the angels who chant divine harmonies and offer love to this poor earth, never before so threatened and stricken. Live this Christmas of yours in a spirit of profound joy because the time has reached its fullness. Enter as of now into the events which are preparing you for his second Christmas. You are drawing close to the moment of the glorious return of Christ, and so do not allow yourselves to be seized with fear or with sadness or with vain curiosity or with useless anxiety. Live in my immaculate heart with the simplicity of little ones each moment of this new advent and make yourselves eagerly ready to throw open the doors of men and of nations to Christ who is coming and open your heart to hopefulness, to welcome with joy the announcement which I am making to you today. The time of his glorious return is in the very act of reaching its fullness. Number 416, Open Your Hearts. Rubio, Vicenza, Italy, December 31, 1989, Last Night of the Year. From every part of the world, gathered together in the cenacle of my immaculate heart, in an act of intense and continual prayer, to live together with me the last hours of this year, which is about to end, it has been a very important year. I have held in my motherly hands the prayers and the sufferings of all my children, and I have deposited them in the open chalice of the divine and merciful heart of my son Jesus. Thus, I have been able to carry out in a powerful way my work of mediation between you and my son, and as your sorrowful and merciful mother, I have interceded before him for all. I have obtained many graces for my priest sons to help them to walk along the road of an ever more perfect witness of life, which would be in conformity with the plan of Jesus and with the great needs of the church of today. I have placed myself at the side of my children, consecrated by virtue of their religious profession, to give them the courage and the enthusiasm to follow Jesus, chaste, poor, and obedient even to Calvary. I have prayed for all my poor sinful children, victims of passions, of vices, of sins, of impurity, of egoism, of hatred, and of rejection of God. In my immaculate heart, I have prepared for them the help of which they have need, that they may be able to return into the arms of their heavenly Father, who is awaiting them all, that he may bind them to himself with the chain of his divine and merciful love. I have prayed for the sick that they may obtain the gift to accept with docility and meekness the cross of their illness. I have prayed for divided families, for the scattered youth, for the nations oppressed under the yoke of slavery, for all the peoples of the earth, I have prayed to obtain for all humanity the great gift of peace. In this, my work of intercession before my son Jesus, you, my little children, through your prayer have given a great power to your heavenly mother. I thank you for your generous response to my wishes and my repeated requests By means of my Marian movement of priests, from every part of the world, I have been able to obtain on the part of priests and of faithful a great response to my request for consecration and for prayer. The Senegals, which I had asked of you in my message of January 17, 1974, have spread everywhere. Now your Heavenly Mother can exercise her great power. As of now, I have in my hands the precious key with which to open the golden door of the divine heart of Jesus, so that he can pour out upon the world the ocean of his mercy. The water which flows from the most sacred heart of Jesus will wash and purify the entire world and will prepare it to live the new era of grace and of holiness which all are awaiting. In these years you will see come to fulfillment the great miracle of divine mercy. Open your hearts, open the hearts of all men so that they can welcome Christ who is coming in the splendor of his light to make all things new.